John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let it humble get away. Mara be your barren day. Lord, Lord. Let it Mara be your barren day. This is on mass, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You are listening to episode 10, titled The Days Can Become Very Long, featuring the story of Randy Edmonds, a work leader for the City of Barrie's Water Department and president of Ask Me Council 93. In the previous episode, we heard the story of Christine, a librarian at Spalding High School, whose brilliance was nurtured by a community college professor's humanities course. Ever since, she has shown her light onto the neglected parts of our past, all while helping her students shine their lights too. In this episode, we will hear the story of Randy Edmonds, a work leader in Barry's Water Department, whose hard work provides us with the most fundamental requirement for life water. He is also the president of his local union, Ask Me 1369, and as president of his union, he does the equally crucial work of ensuring that all workers get what they need to live healthy and dignified lives. He has also worked in Barry's historic Hope Cemetery, where he has been a steward to Barry's multicultural past and present. Imagine facing the force of an entire city's water system coming at you. You have been struggling against it since the afternoon, and now it is early morning. The day has been very long, indeed. You have been working for more than 12 hours. Your body just wants to drop into the shallow river forming under the waterline break. You are practically alone with your small crew, yet thousands of people are depending on you for their water. These are the kinds of heroic acts that Randy and others like him perform on a regular basis. Thanks to workers like him, we can simply walk up to a sink and grab a glass of water whenever we want. We can fill our pots with water to cook our food. We can cleanse ourselves of the dirt and debris of life. But today, our nation faces an aging water workforce and a severe lack of public investment. We have seen the tragic consequences such as the public health crisis of Flint. The problem is compounded by the fact that, like Barry's granite industry, younger generations of workers aren't going into water jobs. According to a 2019 Brookings Institute report, over 50% of water professionals are eligible to retire from their jobs within the next three to five years. We all need water. But it takes all kinds of workers working together for us to live a good life. None of us do anything completely on our own. In Randy's story, we will learn that he wouldn't have been able to face the challenges of his job without the steadfast support of his wife, who ran their household and raised their children. And unlike Randy, her work at home is not acknowledged with a wage. And when domestic work is recognized with a wage, for instance, by wealthier families hiring nannies and maids, that wage is notoriously low. Now, more women work outside of the home. On the one hand, it reflects progress. On the other, it reflects stagnating wages and growing inequality, as more and more households need to have both parents or all adults in the household working just to get by. In the early days of industrialization, the entire family, men, women, and children, were forced from the fields and into those dark satanic mills where they worked every waking moment of their lives for next to nothing. We are quickly returning to that earlier, more brutal form of capitalist exploitation, but with even more powerful technology with which to exploit us. And... The same old divide-and-conquer strategy is being used to keep us competing against one another instead of coming together to improve all our lives. Just as sexism has had the effect of pushing down all wages by pushing down women's wages and not compensating housework, 
Racism and xenophobia have done the same by pushing down the wages of people of color and immigrants and excluding them from rights and protections. Most U.S. households today need to have at least two wage earners on average in order to meet basic needs. I recorded Randy's oral history in 2017. His story will be performed by Carl Etnier. I was born July 7th, 1960. I actually was born in Proctor, Vermont, which is just outside of Rutland. I was raised in Danby, Vermont. I moved to Barrie in 1972. My father took a farming job up here, so he moved us up in 72. My father, he was a farmer, and his expectation for his sons was to be a farmer. We never owned our own farm, per se. He always worked for other people. One day, he was hoping that one of his sons could purchase a farm and run it. I saw my younger brother and my older brother both pursue that career longer than I did, but I saw the handwriting on the wall. I saw where the dairy industry was going, and I saw the hours that were being put in and the pay that they were getting, and I said to myself, nah, no. I'd like to find and do something different. After graduating from high school, I went into the National Guard. I went in and was a member of that for about six years. Then after, I just mainly wandered around, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Did dishwashing jobs. I took up being a cook in the military, so I was a short order chef or cook for some of the local restaurants here. I was bouncing around jobs until 1983 when I took my first full-time job and, and good paying job with Booth Brothers Dairy. I did a milk route, house to house milk route. I was one of the last people to do milk routes. My milk route took me from the city of Barrie to all the way out to Craftsbury, Greensboro, and Hartford. Covered a lot of country, Waitsfield, Duxbury, Waterbury, so I had a massive route. I had some families that would take upwards of six gallons of milk at a time. This was a once a week delivery for them. Other people had it delivered twice a week because they wanted it fresh and they used more. Cheese was a big product you delivered to people. Yogurt was a big, it was a huge thing. A lot of people took a lot of yogurt. And of course, then with WIC, cereal, and all the other formulas for the babies and that stuff. Most days I got started at two o'clock in the morning. By the time you got back to the dairy farm, you had to unload your truck. You had to take your inventory of what was on the truck, and then you had to load your truck back up for the next day. It was about 4, 4.30 p.m. by the time you got home. Then, once I was home, I had these stacks of WIC books that I had to figure out the formulas for what the people were going to get. If you took them home, it saved you time on the route because you didn't have to stop and divide how many quarts they were going to get or whatever. I never got paid for that, neither. I just brought the books home and did it. So I get home at 4.30 p.m., be in bed by 8.30 p.m. or 9 o'clock, then 2 o'clock's rolling around again. When you get on Greensboro Bend, do you get on to Craftsbury? You're getting out there remotely. Booth Brothers didn't want to put any money into their trucks or their equipment. They gave me this old beater of a truck, and picture this. 2.30 in the morning... Out in the middle of Craftsbury, snow, where the road's not even being plowed yet. I got stuck, and I knocked on this door. The lady came to the door. This is unheard of nowadays, but the lady came to the door. I told her my situation. She says, well, she says, they're not going to get around to plowing the roads here until about 6.30 a.m. Why don't you just come in and lay on the couch? I, I looked at her and said, are you serious? She goes, yeah, but here I am all dressed for winter for one thing. I went in, I lay on the couch. I wasn't there for probably but maybe 20 minutes. I just felt kind of weird and I was hot and everything else. I just went out and sat out back in the truck. It was freezing, no heat, no nothing. I was out there with no chains, just 
out there in the element until somebody came along about an hour and a half later and they snaked me out of the snowbank. It was a very taxing job, very damning. Working for Booth Brothers, I got my first glimpse of what it was like to work a job and if you got sick, you still worked. If you got injured, you still worked or else you didn't get paid for it. That's just the way it was up there. What I was looking for through Booth Brothers is to maybe gain access to working inside the plant because inside the plant was more structural hours. I was looking to get off from the trucks because after a while, it just spoiled me from wanting to drive a delivery truck for 11 hours. You just saw so much windshield time. You're just on the road and you're constantly working all the time. I was 22 years old at the time. I met my wife and we started dating and then we moved in together. Her sister and her brother-in-law had lived across the hall from us. One day, her brother-in-law came up to me and said, Hey, the city of Barrie Street Department is looking to hire somebody. He said, You ought to give it a shot. So I went down, filled out an application, and one of the questions on there was, Have you ever ran a plow truck? I had never plowed snow before or anything like that. I had driven a milk truck, but I had never done plowing streets. Long story short, that didn't pan out to nothing. Then he came up to me again and he says, you know they're hiring for the water department. You ought to try that. I'll put in a good word for you with a superintendent because I know him. My brother-in-law at the time was a water meter reader for Barry City. He had a little bit of insight of what the city looked like and stuff like that. That was in 1985. They called me, and that was my interview. They said, we'd like to have you come work for us, for the city of Barrie. I told the city of Barrie Water Department that I wanted to give Booth Brothers my two weeks notice. So for two weeks, I would do my milk route during the daytime. At nighttime, I would come down here, punch in at four o'clock and and do the city thing. (laughs) There was very little sleep, but it was a step up. It was a big step up for me. My wife, girlfriend at the time, she was happy that I wouldn't be up at two o'clock in the morning and had set hours. It was different. I won't forget, we were out on a job and I brought my lunch pail with me. My foreman at the time says to me, well, nine o'clock, coffee break. I looked at him and I says, coffee break? He goes, yeah, we get 15 minute coffee break on the job. I said, really, you sure? He says, yeah. I had my lunch pail with me, so I had my 15-minute coffee break. I said to myself, I think I can get used to this. On the other hand, it was scary, too, because I was coming into a job that can be pretty technical. First of all, you're dealing with people's water, sewer, drinking water. So when you do things, you got to make sure things are clean. Don't get dirt in the pipes and a lot of different things. Then there were just aspects of things that I had never been around, like math was one of my hardest things in high school. Now, all of a sudden, here I've got a job that I have to measure. I got to measure water pipe. I got to measure all the copper. I got to take a water reading, meter reading. I'm a hands-on type of guy, so you show me and I'll learn. It may take me a little while, but I'll learn it. It was scary, but it was beneficial to me too because it was a trade that I had to concentrate on that I'm proud of to this day. That's where I currently work. I started in the water department in 1985. 1999, me and a supervisor, not my current supervisor now, but the supervisor that hired me, we were having some issues. Me and him were having a problem. An opening comes in 1999 for the cemetery department. The cemetery department is still affiliated with the city. From 1999 until 2007, I worked at the cemetery department. Then from 07 until current, I worked back down here in the water department. I am very fortunate to be married to the lady that I'm married to. 
We've been married together for 34 years. I'll tell you what I tell everybody. I hit the lottery when I married that woman. She has been the type of person, she knows that at the time I was a breadwinner, she stayed home. It just wasn't feasible for us to have her go out working, so she stayed home with the kids for the first five years, and I worked the city. I ran a pressure washing business, cleaned stores, whatever it took to get the food back on the table. Every time I had a phone call and it was a water department, no matter where I was or who I was with, she'd come to get me. She'd go, city's on the phone. So I'd come in, I'd take the call, and try to figure it out the best I could over the phone. Or if it was an emergency, I'd say, give me five, 10 minutes, put on some work clothes and I'll be right there. Never once did she ever say, geez, I wish they wouldn't call, or geez, this. Thanksgiving dinners, Christmas dinners, kids' birthdays, soccer games, it doesn't matter. I've been called out on all of them. It never hindered on a fight with each other. I got a foreman that's working with me, and he's been there probably about 29 years. I know his wife for a fact has told him, you tell them you're busy because we got something going on. I never once have had to do that. If I'm really in the middle of something, I'll call somebody else and see if they can't go investigate it. Then when I get done doing what I'm doing, I give them a phone call back and say, are you all right? Need help? The calls, they don't just entail water calls, they entail sewer calls. They entail plugged catch basins. They entail slippery roads. They have a call out and if they can't get a hold of people, they just keep calling until they get somebody on the phone. It does get frustrating sometimes, it really does, because it just seems to be right in the middle of doing something. One of the calls was on the 4th of July. I'm heading outdoors, I got a plate, I got the burgers, I got the hot dogs all set, got the grill all fired up. Telephone rings and it's my supervisor. Well, here I am. I took the tray and handed it to my wife and I says, go ahead, enjoy. Come to find out, it was an emergency call. We had a 16-inch main line break, and it was in a culvert by a river. Response time is everything. That's why I think my profession doesn't get the full, just acknowledgement that we should get. You hear about the fire department, you hear about the police, and they have their hard jobs. I'm not one to sit here and tell anybody they don't have a hard job. But I will challenge them to come out when we did up there. People in the neighborhood are just as mad as a bunch of wet hornets coming at you. My backyard's flooded and this and that. What the hell are we going to do? This is the second time it's happened in a week because of the flood we had. Everybody's in chaos. Then the first question they ask you, when's the water going to be back on? Can't answer that until I open up the ground and see what we got down there. Well, you don't know when it's going to be back on? Finally, my answers just come out. Give me eight hours. Got an answer. You just have to give them something. Something to pacify them. That's what I've learned over the years. Come to find out, we got called out at around 4.30 that afternoon, and I never got home until 3.30 a.m. the following day. Water department. All we have is four guys to take care of 80 miles of pipe and 44,000 water taps. They've cut back. The city's cut back over the years. They just never replaced anybody. What they did was is that any time a worker retired, they never replaced him. Cemetery department can be a very demanding job too. It's hot. There's not much shade up there. You got digging the graves. They dig graves up there year round. They do burials year round. So you're out there in the elements again, cutting graves out with an ax so you can dig them. Setting grass markers, they're 120 pounds a piece. Carrying them out, putting them onto people's lots and stuff like that. I still cover for them on weekends too. It's very repetitive work. (laughs) I'll probably get myself in trouble up there by saying this, but it's pretty mind numbing. The days can become very long up there because Sometimes there's not that much to do. So they put me on dump truck and we drive around and around the cemetery. I was glad when I transferred back to the water department. 
At least you're out in the public and doing different things and you're using your mind a little bit differently. The one thing I found gratifying about the cemetery is just meeting some of the people that you're doing the burials for. A lot of times it's just residents that you know. But I did my first Muslim funeral up there. First Muslim funeral to ever be done in Hope Cemetery. That was very interesting. My supervisor and my foreman at the time didn't show up for it because in a Muslim funeral, they like to take a shovel full of dirt and throw it onto the casket. That's part of the tradition that they do. Because we're union, my foreman thought that they were taking away our job. I said, hey, if you want to step into somebody's religion, you can step into somebody's religion. I said, I'm not. Who am I to tell them that they cannot take a shovel full of dirt from this pile and throw it onto their loved one's casket? And if they bury it for us, that's less we got to do. I don't understand why you're having a hard time with this. But another thing is, at a Muslim's funeral, no women are allowed. The women are to stay at the house, get the coffee ready, get the food ready, and then after the men get done with the burial, then they go back to the house and they celebrate with their relatives and stuff like that. At the time, there was a lady who was working in the office at the cemetery. She was running the cemetery that day, and my superintendent told her, I'm not going to show up. You and Randy's got to take care of it. So we said, okay. So she's standing at the gate at Hope Cemetery, waiting for the procession to come up here, and a couple guys, they're Muslim and Bosnian, they showed up at the gate and they asked her, what are you doing here? She goes, I'm here to accept the burial permit. And they said, no, 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 no. No women allowed. And she goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I don't have no burial permit, and I'm not here. You don't come into the cemetery. And they said, oh, okay. The biggest challenges that I have, and I still have them currently, is the personalities I have to deal with. It's not the job per se, it's the personalities. One time we had the city engineer. He was God to everybody. He thought he was God. He didn't like to hear the word no. So when he'd come down on somebody or reprimanded somebody and they came to me and we had a grievance, whatever, we had to go through him. And he just looked at me with these piercing eyes. It was like, who in the hell do you think you are to come in here and tell me what I can do and what I can't do? So from there, I just kept watching management. And I kept saying to myself, you know, management can't do what they do without the laborers. Laborers can't do what they do without having some type of management. So I just got more and more involved with the union. And people finally retired, so positions would come open. People wouldn't take a slot, so I'd take a slot. I went to a couple courses that AFSCME was putting out and just started learning more and more about it. I've been president of our local now for at least eight or nine years. I've been on the road to every one of my chapters to see what their needs are, what their thoughts are, why they don't want to come to a meeting, why they don't want to run for an office. How do they feel about the union? Let me have it, I don't care. And my model is this. I'm not going to push the union on you. Some people do not like the unions. I personally have issues with the unions myself. I look at unions to give me a voice in what I'm going to get for a pay raise, a voice to keep my benefits. I don't need a union to show management my work ethic because I know my work ethic. It's been enjoyable. It's also been draining at times trying to get people to get involved. My dissatisfaction is that we haven't had reps up here and I've had to go alone on my own in front of school superintendents and other superintendents for other workforces. I've had to find these facts out on my own and how to do it. I mean, I can call down to Boston and ask them, should I be doing this? How should I be doing that? Management can be very intimidating. So when you walk in front of them, you want to be prepared because they've got a lawyer behind them that's doing their work. They're just sitting there presenting what the lawyer is telling them to say. That's all they're doing. I think it's what's made my years of service here with the city hard at times because I wore a bullet on my back and management will look at you as, oh, he knows what he's talking about. Oh, he can be a troublemaker. So they look, and I don't care what they say, they look to find things to maybe help you out the door a little bit quicker. 
or get something to write you up for or whatever. But you come in and do your job to the best of your ability and, and don't give them anything to get you for, not nothing they can do. And people say, well, Randy, you always walk on eggshells. And I say, well, then my path must be long because I've been here 33 years. As I get ready to retire, my plan is to keep working. I'm looking to maybe have a little downtime, but I'm a worker anyways. The pension here with the city isn't all that good. I'm not going to have this big nest egg. They've fooled around with our pensions over the years. I'm going to have to have something to supplement. I want something to supplement anyways because... I'll use my father as an example. He retired from farming and then bought his own first place over in Sandy Pines Trailer Park in East Montpelier. That was his first home. He started working in the park over there, picking up, shoveling roofs, mowing lawns, and just keeping himself busy. Then my mom passed away nine years ago, September 18th. He just stopped. He just didn't have the will to want to do anything anymore, so he just plumped down. Fast forward to now, I just had to put him in Berry Gardens or Rowan Court Nursing Home because he never kept active. I want to keep active. I want to keep myself physically active body-wise, mind-wise, and to have a little bit of extra money in your pocket. You know what I mean? That was Carl performing Randy's story. Carl is a colleague of mine at Goddard College. He does a lot for Goddard. He keeps WGDR running, which is our community radio station. On WGDR, he runs his own radio program called Relocalizing Vermont, which has contributed immensely to local conversations about environmental, social, and economic justice. He also serves as the co-chair of our staff union at Goddard, which belongs to UAW Local 2322. And last but not least, he has also stepped up to help faculty and students during their residencies at Goddard. In the studio, Randy's story prompted some very germane reflections from Carl. So I'm Carl at Nair. I'm a little bit younger than Randy, but not all that much. And I had quite a bit different experience growing up, uh, not in farming. I did get into farming as a, a teenager, to ranching uh, out in California. I was living on a ranch and working 20, 30 hours a week there as part of my education for a couple of years. But uh, I've lived all over the place in this country and for more than a decade outside of the country before settling down to this section of Vermont, part-time in 98 and full-time in 2001, and uh, had a lot of college education as well and worked in academia. And I'm working at the radio station now here at Goddard College. I've got a uh, union background in common with him. When I was living in Scandinavia, then you pretty much can't help being in a union if you're working over there. And uh, now I'm a member of the staff union here at Goddard College and uh, a leader in the union. So I have, have that in common with him. Well, I think I've always been pro-union in theory from you know, learning about U.S. history in high school and uh, learning how important unions were in the 20th century in particular to bring about 40-hour work weeks and decent working conditions so people weren't getting killed all the time on the jobs and, and, uh, and getting more pay for people so that workers would get a decent slice of the riches that were being produced in the country. So I had that theoretical background. And, and then when I moved to Scandinavia, yes, uh, it was just the default mode to be in a union. Uh, here's, here's a story of just how default it, it was. It was a national scandal in Sweden in the 90s when there was this mom and pop bodega in Gothenburg, the second biggest city that had uh, you know, a handful of employees, and they weren't unionized. 
these handful of employees did not belong to a union, and the whole country was talking about it. Uh, so that's how pervasive and, and strong unions are there. Uh, so when I came back to this country in uh, 2001 full-time, then unions are much weaker here. But when I got the opportunity to be at a workplace that was unionizing while I was here, I was glad to be part of that. And uh, when one of my union brothers came to me and said, hey, we need somebody else in our leadership here, uh, would you be a steward? Then that's all it took. I just stepped forward. He's been with the union a lot longer than I have and has uh, has uh, gotten a lot higher in the hierarchy than, than I am or have plans to be. But yeah, it's certainly the same dynamic of getting to know people working in the union in different parts of the union and understanding how they're committed, whether they're committed to the union, what they think of the union, how the union can best be serving them, uh, going out on your own time. He talks about going to the classes that AFSCME put on and uh, yeah, you got to learn on your own time and figure it out as you go. Sometimes you're on your own with management. That hasn't been the case for me. I've I've had good support from both the people around me and from the folks who work for the local. But I can understand how a union person might be put in that position and how uh, intimidating it could be. I think the union has a really good way of educating the brothers and sisters and giving them the confidence to go into meetings like that. Coming from my decade in Scandinavia, I saw countries, I lived five years in Sweden, five years in Norway, I saw countries there that had a whole political system built up around the union. The Social Democrats were the biggest party in both of those countries, and uh, they were at one with the unions, basically. And uh, you know they had a deal with the capitalists going back uh, over 50 years. So you run your part of the country, we run the political side of the country, and uh, we'll get along just fine. And, uh, and here in this country, I think it's important for unions not only to be working for the, the people who are in the union, but to be working for better labor conditions for everybody. And part of that is it just comes out automatically, from my understanding of union history, that when unions are strong, then the wages of non-union workers in the same area are also increased. Uh, but some of that requires working consciously in the political sphere as well. The labor movement is facing increasing challenges with the current administration and also with the Supreme Court that, as we're sitting here in July of 2018, has recently handed down the Janus decision, which is likely to make it more difficult for public sector unions to get paid by the people who are representing them to do the representational work. All other things being equal, that could have some pretty dire consequences for unions. On the other hand, we are seeing that anger about what is happening to unions and to the country as a whole has given a lot of energy to political movements and, uh, and to organizing in general. And we may see that unions fight back that much harder, and it uh, becomes a turning point for the better. Still today, with a good union job, you know, one salary can be enough to raise two kids on, to have a family, and have a decent middle-class life. And I'm glad that's still the case in, in some parts of this country, at least. Well, I thought it was really interesting to see the division of labor in Randy's family. And we don't, from his story, have his wife's side of it. But uh, between him and his wife, the way he tells it, they have a similar division of labor to when I was growing up in, in my family. My mother was uh, trained as a nurse and worked as a nurse until she was six months pregnant with me and uh, then stayed home to raise the kids until I was out of the house and, and uh, then went back to work as a nurse. But during the time that I was growing up, at least, my sister was still in the house when she went back to work. Uh, she She was at home for us, and that's what Randy and his wife have done at a time when most people, both people in the marriage, are out earning money to uh, keep the family afloat financially. And you know, one thing that tells me is, um, you know, there's, there is something attractive. I think it can be something attractive to both sides, to the quote-unquote traditional model, as well as the dual breadwinner.
in my current job, I don't have a position of such responsibility as Randy does where people's ability to flush their toilets or uh, wash their dishes or get water, safe water for drinking is dependent on me putting down my 4th of July barbecue tray and rushing out and helping them. I have in the radio business, um, I have helped WDEV with their coverage of Tropical Storm Irene, and WDEV saw the storm coming, had a pretty good idea of what damage it might do to the state, brought in an emergency generator and other supplies so that they could stay on the air, got permission from the Federal Communications Commission to up their, uh, their power of their transmitter so they could reach a much uh, wider area, and uh, stayed on the air uh, for 24 hours a day bringing the latest reports, and I was part of that team doing that. And uh, occasionally there have been things that approach that a little bit here at, uh, at WGDR, and you know, anytime I do that, there's a sense that, okay, I'm putting my regular life aside, but it's just exciting to be part of a team and to know that you can make a difference in people's lives. Um, there's a book, War is a Force, that gives one meaning. And the title is, it's an anti-war book, but the title is really not meant ironically. Uh, when you're a part of a team, whether you're out trying to avoid getting killed and, and kill people for, uh, for military objectives, or you're just trying to get information accurately out to people, or the cows have gotten through the fence on the farm and you're trying to get them rounded up and get them back to where they need to be, then you've really got a sense of meaning in your life at that, that moment, and that can be exciting. If you have uh, those sorts of emergencies happening too often, if Randy isn't backed up by enough other people in, in his department who can help him out, then it can be long-term stress, I'm sure, and be very hard to deal with. I've been fortunate to have those events spaced out enough that just feels good and exciting to do them. Uh, as far as uh, immigration goes, it, it was fascinating to, to hear Randy's uh, description of the first Muslim funeral that or burial that took place at Hope Cemetery in Barrie. Uh, Hope Cemetery is, uh, the gravestones are uh, carved by immigrants, and Barrie is a huge center of, of immigration and very conscious of uh, their, their immigrant history from Italy, from Sweden, from uh, some parts of the British Isles, and to have another group come in with another faith than they've had probably introduces similar tensions to what they've had in the past with different waves of immigrants. And it was very interesting to hear the Union, in this case, being used as a source of tension with the immigrants who uh, wanted to throw some dirt on the casket. Uh, I'm, I'm with Randy. That seemed like a way too inflexible interpretation of the union rules to say, I'm not going to be any part of a funeral where people are doing my job and throwing dirt on top of the casket. Uh, uh, people have different approaches to these things, and management and unions need to be respecting what the, the client's needs are, especially in such a sensitive time as, as a funeral. And I thought that it was a wonderful story that showed uh, the established folks in the area bending to allow the union rules to be quote-unquote broken. But also we had a woman there uh, saying, you're going to need to change some thinking in your culture as well. You don't have women at your funerals, but this is my job to make sure that you have your permit and to be here to make sure that uh, things go according to our plans. And everybody was flexible, and it worked out just fine, it sounded like. Well, I'm just so glad that we have the opportunity to hear the story of, of Randy, and I'm looking forward to hearing the stories of the other people who you've collected in this podcast series. Um, he's part of my community here. I've, I've never met him. I've uh, you know, spoken with, uh, with people in similar situations, similar jobs in the area, but you know, never heard their work history in the way that Randy laid it out in the interview with you and that I was privileged to be able to reproduce a little bit of for, for our listeners. I look forward to meeting him and shaking his hand.
Before we end the episode, I want to tell you something about Barry's multicultural past that you may not know about. Although not frequently discussed, Arab Americans are part of Barry's history. Like many of the European immigrants who came to work in Barry's granite industry, Arab immigrants, both Christian and Muslim, came to the United States to build better lives for themselves in the 19th and 20th centuries. What was happening economically back home at the time was a declining silk industry. The silk industry, which employed many of them, was consolidated into a monocultural mode of production and integrated into a global trade network. Many Arab silk workers were negatively impacted. A few of them came to Vermont and created new opportunities for themselves, many as entrepreneuring peddlers. And contrary to the extreme oppression of women in some Middle Eastern countries today, which, by the way, the United States abetted through our military support of extremist groups, Arab women in the 19th and early 20th centuries were free to work independently outside of the home. How do you think about class? Did you relate to Randy's story? Are you active in your union or in the labor movement? If so, have you also had to walk on eggshells with management because you have stood up for your co-workers? Do you feel that your job is undervalued? And how do you deal with sexism, racism, xenophobia, and other forms of oppression in the workplace? Let's keep the conversation going. You can post your stories on our Facebook page and Instagram, or send us a tweet at Podcast or email us at onmasspodcast at gmail.com. That's E-N-M-A-S-S-E podcast. For our next and final episode of the season, we will hear the story of Denise, a granite expediter and former sandblaster. Denise is one of the few women working in the granite industry, but she has always been a trailblazer, from when she was a young girl who loved the male-dominated sport of hockey to when she became the president of the Granite Cutters Association, which is her trade union. Through her strength and skill, she has not only helped in creating stunning memorials, she has also helped to keep Barry's progressive labor history alive. Thank you for listening. We have additional reading materials, archived footage, and show notes on our website. While there, you can give us feedback or suggestions for the next season. This is an independently produced show. I receive support from you, my listeners. If you like this show, head to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. Special thanks to our performer, Carl Etnier, and our storyteller, Randy Edmonds, for this episode. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class. John Henry told his captain.